I want to play devil's advocate, and, and I don't mind saying that I am, you know, a, a true blue diehard Democrat. I think one good analogy, for example, is that, um, you know, a year or so ago, Obama said that he was not going to take, um, you know, uh, that he was going to limit his donations. He was going to take the federal money, right. and it was going to be capped. Mm -hmm. And then during the course of the election, he changed his mind because nobody thought that Obama was going to be able to raise more money mm -hmm. than McCain. Mm -hmm. And it was McCain who then said that he was going to be willing to take the limits. Um, but that was because he couldn't raise enough money. No, no, yeah. And so in this instance, you know, there are these code words in the law. Like when people talk about immigration law, mm -hmm. it, it, we don't talk about the fact that maybe there are some Canadians coming over here or, or there are people from Ecuador coming over here illegally. Mm -hmm. We think about Mexicans. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about limiting corporations, the average person thinks of corporations as being uh, rich guys, more often than not mm -hmm. white guys, mm -hmm. a lot of times Republicans. Mm -hmm. You know, these are code words. And so it's like, how does it affect, how is it going to affect my life? So if you perceive that the corporations will have a point of view, that's going to be adverse to your life, then it's like, no, 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 we don't want to see that happen. And, and then Sc Sc that. Scalia and, and mm -hmm. uh, Thomas and, you know, the uh, Supreme Court nominees who have been appointed by Republicans have a different view of well, the world. But right now, though, uh, Roberts and, and Alito, they're, they want free speech, but they're not sure <clears throat> so if they, they want to... Yeah, no, but they, they're not sure. They're not sure if they want to give that free speech to the corporations. One of the arguments that's being made that uh, the corporations are an individual, as, as, we, as we know. It's an artificial entity. That, but what we also have to remember, they were created by the state. They're not a person. Mm -hmm. My, uh, I teach business courses. And one of the things is that, that I'm concerned about is that companies right now mm -hmm. are not that concerned about making decent products. You know, mm -hmm. I'm taking a look at General Motors and what happened yeah. recently with the current economy. But they're more interested in basically saving what they have. Uh -huh. And they're using the legal process for that. So they, they, are, they are a legal entity, but they were created by the state. Mm -hmm. State They should not have the same rights as an individual. Okay. Th this has a recent this. history, doesn't it, right. Victor? The, the, the early 70s it was a time when corporations became um, uh, ostensibly recognized as individuals legally? Well, I mean, the, the law is not static. It changes yeah. over time. And I think, I think a key thing for us to focus on, for example, and one of the things for me is, you know, Brown v. Board of Education, 1954, the law was that uh, separate, separate and equal equal. Was, was okay. And then, uh, at, you know, after that, or that, that case struck down that law and said that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so I think that from a practical standpoint, we should not be of the mindset that the law doesn't change because it does. Sure. Just a couple of things. First of all, I want to talk about uh, the way the Supreme Court works, precedent versus political opinion. That was something you were hinting at before. Uh, this idea, though, about corporate personages doesn't go back to the 1970s. It actually goes back to 1886. It's a, it's a court case called Santa Clara County versus the Southern Pacific Railroad. The, the idea of a corporation as a person wasn't actually in the decision. It was in the head note to the case, and I have the mm. quote for you. The court does not wish to hear arguments on the question whether the provision of the 14th Amendment applies to these corporations. We are all of the opinion that it does. That was by a court reporter not even by one of the justices. In fact, the case was unanimous <laughs> um, in favor of the uh, railroads. What I, what I want to get to, this, this second topic here, is the nature of the case. We know, excuse me, the nature of the court. We know that the justices are appointed by politicians. Perhaps that uh, has something to do with their persuasions. But I'm interested in whether or not this is actually true. Is the Supreme Court just a political animal in the way that the legislature is political? Well, I mean, I, I, from my perspective, I think it depends on who you ask. There, there are, first of all, I think all human beings have biases. And anybody who tells you that they don't have a bias is either just completely ignorant or telling you a falsehood, one or the other. And we, you have these great confirmation hearings and fights. You know, uh, Justice Thomas, uh, you know, Robert Bork, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, Sotomayor just recently. So for anybody to say that the justices don't have opinions, I mean, the Republicans try to appoint people to the bench who they think will adhere to their view of the world, and the Democrats do the same thing. So I do think that there, there's a significant element of politics in it. Now, from, from a judicial standpoint, no judge uh, is necessarily going to publicly acknowledge that his or her views affect how he or she sees the world. They can be disbarred for that. Uh, it, it, it's, just not, it's just not how things are done. Um, but by the same token, we wouldn't have such fights over who's going to be on the, on the Supreme Court 
if we didn't believe that who they are and mm -hmm. the life that they have traveled and the things that they have done Influences is going to have an effect on, who, well, on how they decide. Things. Congress actually has consent, right? They don't have actual uh, it, it, to advise and consent is what Congress is supposed to have as a functioning constitutional uh, uh, impact on decisions for the Supreme Court. So the executive branch does have a balance of power with regard to appointments. And the litmus test uh, question is always the one that gets brought up, right? That politicians are really the executive branch often says, we don't have a litmus test for a particular candidate. When everyone knows, I think you said, test. yeah, everyone knows there's a litmus, there's a litmus, litmus test. test. So right. that kind of dance is something I think <laughs> generally the public is very impatient about. They, they don't really, uh, and it's understandable. I mean, it's, it's, a very, it's very difficult to see the, 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 the long-term impact uh, as you pointed out, Victor, on, of the law, when there's this kind of silly dance, it seems, about litmus tests, no litmus tests. We know it's a Bush appointee, therefore we know this is a, somebody who's going to be probably against Planned Parenthood in some way. So that, that, those that, are the kinds that, of questions that's not always, that's the same way it always end up kind of emerging in the, in the back, back talk. Let me discussion. ask you a question, though, Henry. Don't you think, though, that precedent in previous cases and other legislation has more to do with how the Supreme Court makes its decisions rather than political persuasions? It's supposed to be. Okay. You know, this is what we have common law for, isn't it? Uh, this is why we, you know, going back from the Magna Carta, you know, uh, you know. But I'm asking Britain, you, is so that, do you think that's the case? I, I think that's the case. I think uh, most, most judges work that way. Well, and, and I would say just the opposite. I would say that, yeah. for example, I don't, it's not all one or the other. For example, mm -hmm. it could be that when a judge is deciding a case, and let's go to the Supreme Court level, that they may respect precedents 85, 90, 95 percent of the time, but not 100 percent of the time, because if they respected precedents 100 percent of the time, then you would not have cases that get overturned. Right. 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 And cases mm -hmm. do get overturned. You know, Dred mm -hmm. Scott, you know, got overturned. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they Plessy talked about Ferguson, which we were talking overturned. About they're talking about overturning, um, you know, Roe v. Wade. I mean, you hear discussions mm -hmm. about it. So, you know, if, if a precedent meaning is the law fixed and never changed? Is the answer oh, to no, that I, is no. Was, no, I was well, trying to say right. that. There's a, there, there's right. a professional balance, yes. I think, you know, that, that because there is oversight. Judges who make decisions, especially if they're going to do something as radical as to, to, to uh, a rule over a precedent, they really get scrutinized quite a bit uh, for that particular decision. And everything that they do, including their own methodology, ends up being questioned. So that's the kind of thing that often happens for any judge, left or right. right. But and having said that, we shouldn't assume judges are very, very political. They're we, very political. We shouldn't assume, though, that because a justice is considered conservative, that he's going to behave conservative exactly. on the court. Souter is the best example of that. Appointed as a conservative, and, rules and as a liberal. liberal. And it's happened the opposite too, so you mm -hmm. can't really judge. Pointed by, uh, yeah, by a conservative, right. but well, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. It was even at that time, people didn't know where Souter was, right. uh, and so and so that that's a that's a, an interesting example because the, the litmus test question was one that was openly questionable with Souter's appointment. Well, one of the things you mentioned in your opening statement too was the uh, uh, how the how do we make laws nowadays for an ever changing society? Mm -hmm. And I'm at living here with the law that's supposed to be somewhat fixed with the Constitution. And that is a problem. Uh, again, going back to it's a living, breathing thing. So, Some of and, us think yeah, that. Yeah, well, but it's a modern society. It's hard, it's, it's hard medicine, uh, insurance, the, the current social problems that we have. And this is another situation. Sure, but I, I think, just to answer this question that you're mentioning, I happen not to think that the Constitution is a living, a breathing, breathing document. Life. I happen to be a strict constructionist. I, I think that um, the, the way that a society is changed, therefore, is not through changing the Constitution or reinterpreting the Constitution. I think instead it's done through laws as in the legislature. Um, but perhaps we don't have to have the Constitution <laughs> talk. Throw it out. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm interested in as well is this um, conception of free speech. What we're talking about here is the free speech of a citizen and the free speech of a corporation. Um, what I am interested in thinking about is whether or not all free speech is protected. No, we know that. It's not. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but but, but you, you talk about, though, the free speech of citizens versus a corporation as if it's, and, and I don't believe, there's no box here and box there. It exists on a continuum mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, the citizens own corporations. I mean, w at what point in time does the individual cease to exist and does the corporation start? Mm 